and welcome back. Yes, today we're going to go back to basics with an Arduino Uno, which you can see over there, it could be a Nano, um, and just a handful of components because I needed to sort out a problem. Well, I say problem, a design problem that I think I've overcome now with just a couple of extra components. So I thought I'd just share that with you and uh, maybe you've got some better suggestions, I don't know. Now, a quick shout out to my sponsor, JLC PCB. They're doing a collaboration with Easy EDA. As you know, it's my preferred PCB CAD program. It's simple but powerful. It's intuitive to use. Let's just have a quick look at a design I made recently. So here's a fairly recent design of mine, my ESP32 web radio. Designed it in Easy EDA because it had all the features that I needed. And uh, don't forget the teardrop feature that allows the tracks to be slightly bigger at the ends where they join pins and things to give them a bit more stability. And then you just click the Gerber button at the top here. So that one there. And it says, great, you can either generate your Gerber files directly or all of them at JLC PCB. And if you click that, it will go straight to the JLC PCB site, upload the Gerber files as it's generating them in the background automatically and uh, show you what you can do there. And let's not forget, they got a Facebook group. Here it is. And as you can see, they're joining forces here a bit more transparently so we understand that the two are connected. Easy EDA to design your PCB and JLC PCB to actually manufacture it. Sounds good to me. And if you join the group, there's all sorts of good things on the way. So have a look at that as well. JLC PCB, go and have a look. Now, if we got time, we'll also look at that board at the back, but um, only if we got time, okay? So let's, let's start afresh then with this, and I'll draw out the simple circuit diagram um, of what it is I'm trying to do and why I'm trying to do it. It's almost like a, a GCSE question, this, you know, this is the situation, what can you do to accomplish this? Let's get that, that uh, whiteboard out, shall we? Okay, so this is the problem I'm facing. I have a microcontroller here, and it needs to detect which of these switches has been pressed um, even though you've only got one input. All right, just right, let's just add a little bit of meat to the bones here. Let's assume this here is 5 volts. It won't be, but it's close enough. And this will be about 100K. All right, now this switch closes yeah, to ground. Oh, well, this switch closes to ground. But this microcontroller needs to know which of these switches has closed. If this were a GCSE paper, it'd probably say, which additional components can you add to this drawing to allow the microcontroller to detect each switch? Um, and what I've discovered is... And you'll see where this came from originally. If we put a diode in here and a diode in here, what we've done eventually, effectively is isolate this bit here of the circuit and this bit here from each other. They're still being driven by the plus 5 volts, but once it gets to this point, no current from here can flow up here and down here and vice versa. So we now have effectively two independent um, switch states, haven't we? So now we can say... I want to take a tapping from here straight across into one pin and a tapping from here straight across into another pin. Now these pins on the microcontroller um, are going to be input pins, but because they are isolated like this, and yes, they are sort of driven by the plus 5 volts, um, it doesn't work particularly well unless they're input pull-ups. right? So effectively, let's think what happens now. If we've defined two pins on the microcontroller's input pull-ups, and this is all running connected, you'll read the state of the pins in the microcontroller and go, well, is this low or is it high? When the pins are open like this, it's going to be high, not least because it's an input pull-up, so there's already a weak um, positive supply on each of these pins, plus, of course, you've got the supply coming in here. Really, in some ways, this, this supply here is almost incidental. Now, imagine one of these pins gets shut, okay? So we shut this pin here, the switch. So this is now grounded. So when you read this pin, it goes, is it high or is it low? Well, it must be low because effectively you've got a short now between here through the switch and to ground. So it goes, that one's low. But what about this one? Well, this one, because it's isolated and nothing can go that way, it's high. So we know that that one's low and that one's high. And... Yes, I know you're already ahead of me here. If this one were to shut as well, where well, they'd both be low, or if one were to open and the other one shut, it knows independently now the state of these two switches. Okay, great. That, that was so simple, it was barely worth the 10 points that I was going to award you if you got that right. Why do I need to know this? Okay, next diagram. 
Now, this diagram is half of my auto on off circuit, which you've probably come to know and love. Oh, there we are. Look, there's a little um, reminder of where we use that. Now, what we're, what we're doing here is having a P channel MOSFET, which is therefore normally off because we've biased it slightly via the positive supply here. Uh, that's the 100K resistor. That's all it needs to keep that off. But as soon as we bring that to ground, it will switch this on and therefore power anything else, including, in my case, the microcontroller itself. Great, so we've got one switch, but as I say, I wanted two switches, but I couldn't put another switch simply in parallel like that. That wouldn't work at all for the same reasons as we had in the previous diagram. But by putting in two diodes, one there and one there, so they're independent, we now have two streams for the switches and the microcontroller can take a tapping there and take a tapping there and know which of these switches turned this device on. In other words, the microcontroller wakes up and goes, I'm, I've suddenly woken up, I've been powered up. What switched me on? Was it this switch or was it that switch? Yeah, okay, Bacon, you're saying, so far so good, all pretty, you know, numpty stuff. Where's, where's this going? Okay, let me show you. Now, before you all go, oh no, not another fridge alarm. Yes, I'm afraid it is because it's a real world problem. I didn't think I was gonna have this problem in my new place but I do need a fridge alarm for when the door's left open. Now you might say, why do you keep leaving the door open? Are you really that stupid? Well, there's more to it than that. I'll explain when we go inside and have a look at my fridge and why there is a problem. And this is the switch that we'll be looking at. See this, this is specifically designed as a cupboard switch. Um, now I actually bought this from Amazon, but I'm sure you can get them anywhere. I bought a pair, they came in pairs, I think. And uh, basically what happens is they're designed for cupboards and drawers and things like that. So as the, the cupboard edge hits this, it pushes it in. And you can probably hear that clicking sound, can't you? There's a sort of micro switch thingy in, inside it. And it, it turns, well, this is meant for lights, I would imagine. All right, so as you open up a cupboard door, it's shut like that. Normally you open up the cupboard or wardrobe door, the contact's made inside and the light goes on. Doesn't have to be mains powered, of course, could be battery powered for the short amount of time that wardrobe door is opened. Um, but this is a an actual real world problem that I have. So yeah, it is another simple fridge alarm, but why do I need two switches? Let's go indoors and, and have a look. So the door of this fridge being um, a standard uh, fridge, it has a place down here for bottles and stuff. When this door shuts, this bit with the bottles in fits nicely into here, right? But this shelf here, if you like, is not somewhere where we'd normally put anything. We wouldn't start putting this down here because we know this is where the door shuts into it. So the fundamental difference between that fridge and this one is that this one's built into this cupboard. Yeah, it's one of these built-in things. So the, there's a standard cupboard, but the fridge is built into this cupboard and the door and all that is hinged on there. But this is where the problem lies. Because this fridge is now much, so much smaller, look at where this tray sits in here along this bit of the shelf. So as it shuts, you can see it takes up room, all that room in there. And of course, the temptation is to put stuff like this, especially that, mm -hmm, there as though that were a storage shelf. But then we come to shut the door and it hits it, look, and it won't shut. So what I've got at the top of this fridge up there, stuck on with some blue tack at the moment, is one of those, those uh, switches just to prove that it works. And if I open up the cupboard next door and swing around, you'll see that that switch then will stick out. I think it's been moved actually, but say it was like that. And I shut the fridge door and it clicks that on and off. You can probably just make out that it's doing it. That. See? Okay. Okay, so that's the description of the first door. Why do I need two switches? It's pretty obvious now, isn't it? Right, you've seen the fridge door then. But what's If that's the fridge door, what's this one? Well, that's the freezer door, isn't it? It's an independent door and could easily be wedged open if 
one of these drawers, for example, were left a little bit ajar or something, you know, too much was crammed in, the cupboard to try and shut and would be prevented from doing so. So I think, okay, well, as all this is built in as well, uh, we could put another switch or something in here. However, this door is not as heavy as the fridge door because there's nothing along here. So I might need to use a micro switch rather than that uh, rather solid cupboard switch. We shall see. And there we have it, right? Now, this is a real world problem for me and presumably for many other people as well. That They just put up with it because they're not Arduinites and they don't know how to fix it, but we do. Now, I was thinking um, with that uh, freezer door, because the freezer door is lighter, got less mass behind it, I might have to revert to one of these micro switches. And I didn't realize, I mean, there's, there's four different ones here with the levers, rollers and whatever, but the, the force you need to press on this long levered one, for example, is still quite a bit. It's about, I've measured it, it's about 30 to 40 grams. Uh, some of these are a little bit lighter. Oh, that one's a little bit lighter. You probably hear them clicking. But basically, I didn't realise you can actually get different micro switches with different forces required on that switch to close it. You can get it right down to like half a gram, so basically you can breathe on it or something, and the thing will close, to those that require, you know, 100 grams or more to, to press on here before they'll close. So I might have to revert to a micro switch, but my goodness, don't they look ugly and out of place in a domestic environment compared to that white one that does look as though it's part of the furniture and, well, it just looks like it should be there, really. Okay, enough of the theory then. We know that something's going to happen with that device. Let's see how it works. I've got a very simple sketch that detects the state of each of these two buttons, right? And when either of the two buttons is pressed, the light will go on just to prove that we've detected it. And uh, yeah, the wiring is just as I showed you in that circuit diagram. So let's fire up the code and have a look. And I'm back. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. My old PC blew up. The blue screen of death. And it was rude about it. What is going on? Pushing that to one side. As you can see up there, it says setup complete. So the sketch is running. Okay, there we are. So that's, that's now into the picture. You can see what's going on down here. Right. So what happens then when I press a button? First of all, let's press this one. And it says the freezer door is open and the lights come on. And I let go and it goes, okay, doors are closed. And with the other one, it goes, oh, the fridge door's open and let go. And it says doors are closed. Great, as you'd expect. And if I press both at the same time, although, of course, there's never anything at the same time about a microcontroller. But if I do that, you get interleaved messages saying the fridge door and the freezer door is open. And if I release one, just the remaining fridge door is open. And if I open the other one again, you get both and I can release it. And it all works as you'd expect. It's a very simple sketch, isn't it? So... In translating this into real world now, it means when we're opening the fridge and the freezer up inside the house, it doesn't matter what combination we open them up in, and if we shut one and reopen it again, so we've got to put the milk in or something, this is going to handle it. I'm going to have to build this fridge alarm, and we had that huge exercise way back into how much can we cram into an 80 tiny 13. And before you ask, no, I'm not using AT Tiny 13. I'll be using an AT Mega 328P because, well, I know it. I know it well, and I can put it into sleep mode and everything because this fridge alarm will be very similar to the circuit board back there. Now, if you remember that bin lid monitor, it uses a switch in a similar manner like that one we had earlier on, that fridge switch, so this one. But uh, instead of a, an actual physical switch, this one uses a tilt switch, that thing there. And there's a little ball inside there, so that's open like that. And when the ball runs down, as you can see, it's going to short out those two pins there and turn it on. But what it does, it doesn't, doesn't trigger anything on the microcontroller at that point. All it, done, it does is turn on the power to the entire unit by virtue of the fact of this tiny little SI4599. That's a dual MOSFET. And we've, we've been through all that before. Um, very, very useful. I'm using it all the time and I will be using it for the fridge alarm as well. 
Now, I said if we got time, we'd have a very quick look at this. And um, I've soldered in all the components, but not actually connected in the NRF yet or the microcontroller, because it suddenly dawned on me, having finished this, I thought, great, now I can uh, plug it all in. And Oh, hang on a minute. I haven't actually written the sketch yet for that microcontroller. Hmm, that could be a downer. I better do that offline. And if you notice, um, I have allowed room here for a crystal and two little... Um, capacitors 22 picofarad or something because i might have wanted to run this on crystal but i'm not going to i'm going to run it on the 8 megahertz internal oscillator so i've connected up the power the power goes down to this si4599 dual mosfet and currently it's off and we know it's off because no power is being supplied to the microcontroller because that led that blue led yes i snaffled it from that previous circuit um is off but if I tilt it so that this bearing in this tilt switch here rolls down and connects those two pins, it turns the gate on here and should supply power to that. Let's have a look. Oh, there we are. Look. So at least at least that bit's working. Even if the, uh, the switch off is quite slow, isn't it? It sort of fades out. Why does it do that? Well, <clears throat> somewhere in here, probably there and there. I've got a couple of capacitors just to sort of have a little reservoir. This one here, I don't know what value that is off the top of my head, probably 100 or something, is to give the NRF24 a bit of um, you know, reserve power if it needs it, just for those little bursts. This is, in fact, a, um, a charger for the battery on the basis that I don't really want to take the battery out. I want to charge it up via this little thing. So that allows me to plug in a standard you know, USB 5-volt supply in there, and it will charge up the battery, and it would power... The circuitry as well but i'm not bothered about that that's not what i'm doing it for i'll just whip it out the bin lid charge it up you know every so often six months <laughs> a year who knows what do you mean a week come on it's got to last longer than that um and i don't need to take it out because to put this in the wrong way around will immediately destroy all this and no i didn't put the reverse circuitry protection in because um i just didn't all right that's why i've got these plus signs everywhere to remind me which way round to put the battery in if I do have to have taken it out. Okay, so I haven't got very far, but we'll look at that probably next time, assuming I get it working. Okay, cool. Right, I think I think that's enough for now. This is a uh, both the things we've talked about here, both this and the fridge alarm are good sort of beginner projects. The fridge alarm is probably easier and simpler to understand, but the same principles that we've used are going to be used in the fridge alarm for the power circuitry is exactly the same as what we're using in here. A single switch turning on the power. In this case, it's a rollable inside this tilt switch. But for my fridge, it will be this, this thing here that will be screwed on the side and uh, used to trigger the power itself. Cool. See, everything has a reason in my world. Now, don't forget to visit my sponsor. They really do like you to go and have a look at their website. Just have a go on, can have a quick look. I'm asking you to do it. Just have a quick look and see what they can do. You never know. You might think, yeah, I will make a PCB. I've got to make one, obviously, for the fridge alarm now. Uh, yeah, so that's the first thing. If you like this video, do give it a thumbs up. Put your comments down below. Don't forget to subscribe and all that jazz. Okay, cool. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.